All right, thank you very much for staying with us to our last final panel, last but not least. So I'm uh, Tuve Gerin with the GISS, and I'm very happy to introduce our next panelist. It's a uh, very exciting and stellar people that we were able to invite here. So first up, we have Dr. Shalom Val. Uh, Dr. Val is a, has this vantage point that very few people uh, in doing research of China and Africa and China-Israel relations have that not only did he study it, he also experienced it, he influenced it and born in Italy, growing up in Switzerland, working for the OECD for many decades in policy. He's a true renaissance man involved not just in uh, policy proper but also in biotechnology, in tech, in innovation, in religion studies and really uh, a feast, a celebration of what it means to be an academic and we're so honored to have you here with us as our first panelist. And our second guest is Ms. Galia Levy with the Institute of National Security Studies, the INSS. Uh, they're a competition but we like their work and we're very thrilled to have Galia here. Uh, the work that Galia has been producing uh, with Dr. Dorimela and Safar Ayon and all the good folk in the INSS is commendable and extremely important uh, for my own personal study and for people interested in China and Israel relations in general. And remember, it might seem like a niche topic, China and Israel, but it's really not. Uh, not just because Israel thinks of itself as the jungle, as the middle kingdom, but also you can see it as a case study of what it means to be a uh, middle power, quote unquote, or at least a country that is nestled between the two giant, the two elephants in the room, the two whales, big uranium. Uh, and this is what Gallia's research has been highlighting uh, so well, looking at infrastructure and investments. And throughout the Gamut of China, US, uh, and Israel triangle, uh, she, she and the team covered it all, and it really is illuminating. And last uh, but not least is my good friend and mentor. Uh, Alexander Pilsner, uh, formerly with us the GISS, but also with the INSS, uh, now with Strategy Risk. Alex is just amazing. Uh, his work has been teaching me so much uh, throughout my career from the beginning. And I owe him a lot, and I'm just super thrilled to have him here with us uh, to talk about his bread and butter, Chinese media. And without further ado, let's uh, welcome our first panelist, Dr. Bal. Shalom, uh, stage is yours. complaints we have. Looks like a litany of complaints against the United States. Let me make one thing very clear from the very beginning. Our relationship with the United States is deep, it's long, it's unbreakable, it is immense, and what is happening about China is not the major most important issue uh, that we have. But we, it's like toothache in a very healthy body. Toothache is unpleasant, has to be treated. What is the main problem we have at this moment, today, yesterday, tomorrow, I will say that, and I'm not revealing any secret because I have no secrets, but I follow the news, I know Israel very well, and I will tell you something that will make you up. Israel, today, tomorrow, prepares to strike Iran, because Iran is our worst threat. For this we need an American umbrella, and this is the reason why our defense ministers, our chiefs of staff, our chiefs of intelligence are meeting every other day, here or in Washington, are talking every other day, by phone, by email, whatever. Where does China come in here? Because this is about China. China is the only country in the world that could coerce Iran to change policy without using force. Only China can do that. America cannot. They try, they cannot. Europe cannot. They won't even try. China can. They will not do it for the time being, for their own good reasons. That's the situation we are in now. Now, um, I will not say more about this. 
I will want to speak about the past. The past is so much more reassuring than the future. <laughs> so, uh, do we talk about the relationship between the bilateral relationship between China and Israel? There is no such relationship. The relationship between these countries is a trilateral relationship because the American hand was in from the very beginning. From 1951 on, there was no purely bilateral relationship, it was always a trilateral relationship. But what's bilateral, but what's bilateral is a, a relationship between Jews, the Jewish people, and China. That relationship is 1,500 years old, if not older. Now, why do I mention this? Because my obvious history, no. Because for China, Chinese, the Chinese reading public, Chinese policy makers, history is very important. The Chinese keep referring to history to explain current events. And we do have a very old history which is small, it is marginal in the sense the sino judaic relationship was not uh, existential, not for China, not for the Jews, but it was a continuous relationship and it was always a peaceful, friendly relationship. And that's important. So when the Chinese ambassador to Israel at the uh, at celebrating the anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations celebrated the, the thousand-year-old friendship between Israel and, um, and China, uh, it's, it's rhetoric, but it is more than rhetoric. Sure, the Chinese ambassador to Tehran said the same, the Chinese ambassador to Egypt said the same, uh, but there is more than rhetoric. It's an idea that does not, does not determine foreign policy, but it informs foreign policy, it informs people, it informs the President Xi Jinping, and I will talk about this in a moment. The uh, trajectory of Judeo-Chinese relations could not be more different from the trajectory of Chinese-American relations. And that comes out in the problem we have in the United States. Uh, contrary to the Sino-Judaic relationship, the American-Chinese relationship is young, is recent, it is of extreme importance for both countries. China was important for the United States from the 19th century on. America was very important for uh, China. Uh, it is a relationship that oscillates between friendship at home and hostility at war. It's a relationship that has led to a deep uh, emotional baggage in both countries. Jews and Israelis have no baggage with China. We, we are okay with them. And they, if it were not for the present problems, this, uh, it would be okay. Let me say a few things about this whole relationship. The first proof of Jews in China dates back to the end of the 8th century. 8th century, which is say 1710. It's a page written in Hebrew, which was found on the Silk Road, found in a grotto in China, uh, taken away uh, by French archaeologists, and you can see it in Paris. That page is a page of Zilchot. It's a page of penitential prayers, which Jews there and are still praying in the days before uh, our whole, very important holy days, the Jewish New Year. It's a very moving page. It, it quotes it quotes uh, a prophetic a couple of prophets which says, which prays to God, please raise the flag of Judah over our country again. It's practically a Zionist document. So Jews were traveling on the Silk Road and one of them uh, was not careful on his camel, a dromedar, and this, uh, this page fell out of his, uh, his pocket, was picked up by a Chinese person, brought it to the grotto, and there it stayed from the year 800, where the grotto was closed, until the French archaeologists found it, stole it. The Chinese are very brand new, very, very generous in this case. They don't ask for these things back. Anyway, then a couple of centuries later, we see the emergence of a Jewish community in Kaifang, 
which was the capital of the Song dynasty, very prestigious place then. For 800 years, a Jewish community lived and flourished in Kaifang. Uh, Chinese Jews who, uh, uh, produced a synthesis between Confucianism and Judaism, kept the Jewish laws, but interpreted them in Chinese ways as it went very well. There was never a problem for them. Some of these Jews in this community uh, got the uh, uh, they are rising very high. A couple of them were senior officials, and several of them were senior military commanders. Chinese troops commanding the imperial Chinese armies in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, quite an interesting thing. Um, so, as the uh, Kaifang uh, community did slowly disappear in the, in the uh, uh, misery of Kaifang, which was in terrible economic and social uh, conditions in the late 19th century. Chinese intellectuals who traveled in Europe for the first time met real Jews, Western Jews, and they noticed and wrote that these people were humiliated and ill-treated. And then suddenly they found there is a similarity to Chinese. So, Five minutes more, well, that's uh, uh, okay. So, uh, Sun Yat-sen, the first president of China, uh, had these feelings. For these reasons, he supported Zionism, he supported the Balfour Declaration. Uh, in Shanghai, 20,000 Jews were saved. This was very important for, for China, uh, which is still proud of this. For Jews, very important. Even the communist, Chinese communists were not hostile to Jews uh, at the beginning, during the Cold War, of course, Mao turned totally against Israel as a Western country, but this was never based on anti-Semitism. Xi uh, Jinping keeps talking of the humiliation of China. Uh, every second speech mentions, mentions the humiliation. The West is deeply mistaken not to take this comment seriously. You know, you know, just listen and take it's just rhetoric. It is rhetoric, but it means more. For the Jews, it has a double meaning. Uh, it has a major downside because the Chinese instinctively feel that they have something in common for the Jews. They expect the Jews to be more active in trying to moderate hostility, American hostility. And this is not happening. Uh, this is upsetting for China. So the the. Uh, absence of a moderating Jewish force in the uh, conflict between America and China is a problem and it is magnified by the enormous overestimation of, by the Chinese of Jewish power. The Chinese are convinced that Jewish power is immense and Jews do this, do that. I can give you examples that I got from, you know, from talks in, in Beijing with important people. It's something surprising what they believe Jews can do. We cannot do, we are not uh, that superpower. Uh, at the end of this, because uh, America allegedly, the Jews control America, and America is against China, you have now the first time in history a wave for anti Semitism with Chinese characteristics by Master Dietrich is an expert of this, and he can tell you more about this. So, uh, do I have five minutes more to go through this or not? We'll go with the question session. Question session. Okay. So that is, I could tell you. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I cannot find it. After, after, okay. Question. Thank you very much, Dr. Bao. Uh, our next uh, panelist uh, is Daniel Levine. Please take the stage. And while uh, Gabriel is setting up, I want to thank again our host, gracious host here at Tantour. I'd like to thank our DJ behind the scenes, Mataz. He's been doing his work diligently for us and keeping everything going to pre core that's not here. And of course, Adi. Uh, please, a round of applause. She really makes the thing go on. Thank you all, really. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. 
and thank you for having me here, Kuzia and the uh, AGISS, as all we are so called home arrivals. It's just the old folks of the most institute. Uh, two remarks before I start. First, I took the liberty to change the title of my uh, talk from Chinese uh, infrastructure investment, that was the original, to involvement. Okay? Because, spoiler alert, Chinese do not invest in Israeli um, infrastructure, as I will explain later. Second, I'm a historian in my training, so uh, with your permission, I will read. Okay, this is what we historians do. Um, okay, so um, as you are well, well aware, Chinese companies are involved in many sectors of infrastructure in Israel, from power to dissemination plants to railways and ports. This involvement raised several security concerns, especially regarding Chinese leasing of Haifa's Bayport, but in some other infrastructures as well. I will go through uh, uh, these risks and explain more about them. Uh, I, I took only four risks, of course, you can uh, uh, name several more, but these are the main risks that are usually uh, raised. The first is espionage and cyber operations. It has been suggested that the Chinese can use the facility to spy over nearby targets, or they can insert some components uh, that will enable cyber attacks. So put some components inside this infrastructure. Well, first, in the first 21st century, we no longer need the facility to do that. We have uh, satellites, or even a computer from the other side of the uh, world. And second, and more importantly, if we still see this uh, a risk or threat as valid, uh, according to foreign uh, sources, we do have the security agencies, some of the best in the world security agencies, that this is exactly their jobs to prevent uh, this from happening and uh, um, to make sure to have some uh, prim uh, primitive uh, preventive uh, measures. I will not elaborate more on that, although we can talk about it more later. Uh, second risk is taking control over the asset following a debt threat. This sounds like a serious threat, especially after several alleged some um, uh, traps have already been reported around the world. For example, look. what happened? Just a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, for example, I have uh, two examples here. Uh, you have the uh, Godal port in Pakistan. In uh, November 2015, the port was leased uh, for chi to China for a period of 43 uh, years. Uh, the more uh, alarming case was uh, Hambantota uh, port in Sri Lanka, which was in uh, 2017 uh, leased. 70% um, of it was leased to uh, China for a period of 99 years. Maybe the 99 was the, the, the number that made it most alert because we all remember that the British uh, uh, got a lease on Hong Kong for 99 years, so maybe this was kind of uh, I know, an alarming. And uh, uh, of course, the PRL scored in 2015, January 2015, Costco Group acquired 51% of uh, percent of uh, PRL's port authority shares. In 2020, it uh, has even more, it has 67% uh, um, of the port uh, shares. Um, there are actually uh, um, debates over the question whether these cases were really uh, death trapped, but the important question is, can this happen in Israel? And the short answer is no, for the mere reason that foreign companies do not invest or fund a, a, a projects in Israel, infrastructure projects in Israel. And Israel does not take loans from foreign com uh, countries to build its infrastructure. Therefore, foreign companies, including the Chinese, are used in two ways. The first, as contractors that get paid by the Israeli government. So they come, they build the facility, they get paid and they leave. The second uh, model is the BOT, foreign company is building the facility, it operates it for a period of time, in which in this time it of course uh, um, gets paid uh, for the uh, uh, operation, and then it transfers it back to the government. 
This model for, is uh, implemented, for example, in Haifa's Bayport uh, project. Um, let's move on. Let's move on. A third risk is disrupting the activity or leveraging the control for political influence over the government. Again, a concerning uh, a threat or risk, and I will use two examples to show how this threat can and is managed in two different infrastructures in Israel. The first, the first is the Haifa port, Bay port, which I know you are all interested in. In this slide, you can see that the Chinese company SIPG, Shanghai. Uh, international uh, um, port group um, controls a dock of 800 meters long. Okay, it doesn't have all the, all the high port. High port is, is consisted of, of several uh, 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 quays or several uh, uh, platforms, and the Chinese company only operates 800 meters of one uh, um, one dock. Uh, Sorry? One pier. One pier. Okay. Compared to the total length of Israeli container platforms of 5,010 meters, it means that SAPG controls a little less than 16% of the total uh, length. It means that even if SAPG decides tomorrow to shut down the port, which is against its own interest, this action will have limited impact on Israel's economy. It doesn't mean it doesn't have any impact, but it has limited impact on the Israel economy. Okay. Um, also, SAPG is the operator of the container port. Uh, it, sorry, uh, is the operator of the co uh, container port. It is not its owner. The ownership is only Israel, Israel uh, state. Uh, it is uh, SAPG is subject to Israeli law, the Israeli security authorities, and to the Israeli port authorities, the IPA, which is a governmental uh, company. Therefore, SAPG does not even have the authority to allow ships to enter into the complex of the Haifa port. This is within the sole responsibility of the I IPA. The second example is from the power sector. Uh, in 2019, a group of companies won the Alon to power station in Tender. Uh, one of them was PMEC, a pan-Mediterranean uh, engineering company, which is also known from, uh, as the company who built the Ashdod port, the new uh, south port in Ashdod. PMEC was restricted to 34.5% ownership, or ownership and was forced to give up its control over the company and its veto right decisions. Looking into the power sector as a whole, the electricity uh, reform limited foreign companies to the production of power only, while the transmission of electricity to consumers, as well as the management of the system, were kept in the hands of Israeli uh, government uh, companies. To avoid centralization, centralization, each company cannot control more than 20% of the total capacity. Now we'll go to the fourth uh, slide, uh, the fourth uh, risk which is jeopardizing the Israeli-United uh, Israel States relation. As you all know, the U.S. is pressuring countries all around the world, and Israel is no exception, to avoid Chinese investment in the highway, uh, high-tech sector and infrastructure. The pressure started within, uh, with the Trump administration, but it did not ease after Biden took the, the lead, as there is a bipartisan agreement in the U.S. regarding the China threat or rivalry, or whatever you want to call it. This pressure was difficult for Israel to deal with, especially because it was not clear at the beginning what the United, the United States wanted. Can we buy cranes from the Chinese companies? The U.S. does. Can we employ Chinese companies in ports? The U.S. does. And so on and so forth. Also, what are the alternatives? For example, in the pay, in the paper tender, Israel asked for uh, U.S. companies to participate, but none came. Therefore, the choice was between SIPG to SIPG. In, in 20, okay, I read it very, very fast. Okay, in uh, 2019, Israel established the foreign investment screening mechanism, which started to operate in January 2020. The US did not and still doesn't consider this mechanism as a good solution. Uh, they thought we need to do something more like a CFIUS. Uh, but uh, so far, this is the only mechanism that was uh, um, adopted. The question is, is it enough? 
where I recently examined infrastructure tenders from several sectors uh, over the past two decades. Um, and uh, uh, the report is going to be published soon uh, the, uh, by the IMSS. And But the data shows some interesting findings. One of them I can uh, disclose here um, is that there is a decline in Chinese participation in, uh, in, participation in tenders from 2019 uh, as the peak year and from then it go down. Uh, of course, I cannot uh, reveal more now, but uh, um, there is a clear decline both in participation and in uh, winning tenders in uh, Israel. Uh, will my report satisfy the US? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, we have some representatives in here of the US. You can ask them uh, later. To sum up, Chinese and all foreign investment in infrastructure projects in Israel have some risks, but those risks can be managed. The risk of debt trap is not valid here, but there is a risk of leveraging the economic involvement for political influence of the government. This risk should be limited using the same models that were used in the power and import sectors. As for the US, President Biden laid the compete, confront, cooperate concept. Israel can certainly cooperate with China where it is possible. This applies also to the INSS and the GISS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite our uh, final panelists for the day, and again last but definitely not least, uh, Mr. Alexander B. Pepsner. And while you take the stage, I uh, would like to ask our American interlocutors that are here with us in the room uh, a question or some of an anecdote that I was thinking as Galia was speaking. Uh, because many of the things she mentioned uh, impact directly our bilateral relations with China. And this anecdote I really like to bring up is when in June of last year, our former Mossad chief, the model, Yossi Cohen, was given his honorary doctorate in Bar Ilan. And then someone asked him about China. And do you know what he said? And I'm saying this word to word, I'm not paraphrasing. I don't know what the Americans want from China. China is not our enemy. If someone understands, please let me know, because I don't. And when our American friends hear this kind of thing mentioned by someone in this top position, it completely blows their mind away. It completely puzzles. How is it possible that we have such a chasm between Israeli and American perceptions? When Israeli perception about China is somewhere over here, where America is way over there, and vice versa, by the way, well, Israel is on Iran, way over here, even here, America is somewhere over there, even lower now with approaching to Iran. Hopefully this will change with Biden's visit. So this is something I'd like to throw to the audience uh, before we continue to our next panel, and then we'll circle back to that during the audience question. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours. So, brave souls, thank you for staying. Uh, but after me, it's dinner. Uh, my name is Alex, and it's very nice to see our friends and colleagues here. And I want to second uh, something that Tuvia said, that uh, Israel-China, why it's not massive as China and the US, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, case study. A case study not only for China's policy in the region, in the Middle East, in MENA, uh, compared with Israel, but also uh, what is much trumped, bandied, talked about, so-called uh, efforts of Chinese external propaganda, which are very, very feeble in Israel, and I will show you. Uh, so, uh, what is China's role? As you know, as good Leninists, we all know that the role of the media in China, in China or in any Leninist system is agit prop, right? Agitatia and propaganda, right? To mobilize uh, the masses, not just the masses, also to publicize uh, government policy to make it known and to mobilize uh, the officialdom, let's put it this way. But when we go a step outside of China, then it's, of course it's also external propaganda showing uh, uh, you know, China's positive image. The problem in Israel, uh, for China, not for Israel, the problem uh, for China is that there is no audience uh, in Israel specifically. So, for example, we have CGTN, that's the international arm of uh, the Chinese television, broadcasts in many languages. There is CGTN Arabic, it is active, 
uh, in, uh, in across the Middle East. Uh, but you know, in Israel, it's uh, it's irrelevant. Of course, there's CG, CGTN English, but I don't know if anyone in Israel uh, watches it. Yes, I do. <laughs> we found the, the one faithful client of CGTN English. Um, there's, uh, of course, uh, English publications in China, like China Daily. You know, it exists in the U.S. and Europe. It doesn't exist uh, uh, in Israel. Okay. Um, um, there was, I was approached numerous times by various Chinese officials and Chinese media to help spread the Chinese uh, word. I've been working with Chinese media for many years uh, to help spread the Chinese word in Israel. Um, but unlike, let's say, Australia, where there's a huge Chinese diaspora, or the US, of course, or other markets, where, as uh, for example, there was a big uh, investigation by Reuters. Chinese have bought a lot of local newspapers or radio stations in the US and Australia. Uh, Israel has no Chinese community to speak of. Okay? There are maybe a thousand uh, Chinese spouses and that's about it. Um, what else? So how does the Chinese spread their message in, uh, in Israel? Well, uh, they are reduced to opinion at like op-eds in the Jerusalem Post or on other English uh, media and uh, via Facebook. So there is an outlet called China Radio International uh, broadcasting in 65 languages. Hebrew is one of them. It's the only Chinese media outlet with uh, Hebrew operations. And they're very active on Facebook. Yeah. But the uh, material is only soft, soft, soft issues. There's nothing about you know, Xinjiang and stuff like this. Um, now, of course, Chinese media has another role, that is intelligence uh, gathering. Uh, this is also, I think, sometimes a little bit misunderstood, but is, there is such a thing called Late Sun, internal publications, which Xinhua and People's Daily People write. Um, I could say to this distinguished audience that I was approached many times for interviews, internal interviews, and, and it's all about uh, Let's say topics that the Chinese leadership deems too sensitive. Okay, so in this case, uh, Nate Sun can be viewed as a corrective to Chinese uh, foreign policy. So, for example, what does the, uh, how does the Israeli public view a certain Chinese initiative? Okay, it's never published. It goes to wherever it goes. Now, uh, we know under the Trump administration, since uh, early 2020. Uh, there was a series of steps taken against Chinese media in the U.S. 15, 15, one, five, uh, media outlets uh, were um, designated a foreign mission. That means they, they need to provide more transparency. It's harder to get people inside. Um, it's, uh, the Trump administration put a limit on number of Chinese journalists in the U.S. It used to be 160. They said the cap is 100, so basically affecting basically uh, sending 60 uh, Chinese journalists uh, packing, and I understand from my uh, friends and interlocutors in the US, it's basically impossible to get a visa for a Chinese journalist to, to, uh, to the US. Now, how does the Chinese media work in Israel? So, let's look at the foreign media landscape in, uh, in Israel. Is there Israel, unfortunately, is a news generator. We know that there's a lot of foreign media. Uh, in Israel. Um, since uh, the Arab Spring, there was a big drop in the number of foreign, I mean accredited foreign journalists uh, in Israel. There used to be about a thousand, now there are about 250 people, uh, journalists that are holding GPO cards. Of course, if there's a flare up in Gaza or whatever, uh, you know, foreign outlets tend to send more people over. This is something the Chinese almost never do. They're much more rigid in their operations. Occasionally you have people coming over from, from Cairo, from by the People's Daily. Uh, so, the Chinese media, regularly, permanently based Chinese journalists in Israel, are about 10 or 11, it depends, over the pandemic and visas and everything. Uh, about 10 or 11 people, regularly based from five media outlets. That's about 4% of the foreign media corps in Israel, okay? For 10 out of uh, 250. So that's not, uh, not massive, but this is what I made the shortest, yeah. 
the shortest slide I've ever made, just one graph that I wanted to show you. Okay. This is the number of Chinese journalists in select countries. I didn't check all the movies. In select countries, uh, and with some, car some comparison with uh, Europe. So you see, with the exception of Egypt, Israel has the largest uh, number of Chinese uh, journalists. Okay? Uh, Egypt has a huge number, actually uh, 20, 20 journalists, these are journalists, that's actually another 30, 40 editors. Why? Because Egypt is the regional headquarters for all the Chinese media, so there's a lot of editorial going on here and also English operations, not just Chinese. So overall there's about 50 or 60 Chinese uh, journalists and editors sitting in Cairo. Xinhua has a whole building there. Uh, but purely, and of course they don't focus just on Egypt, they focus also on uh, Africa. Uh, you see uh, the same number of journalists in Israel as in uh, Turkey and the UAE, more than Iran, for example, more than Saudi, right? You would think you don't, there's no direct correlation between the economic relationship and the political relationship, right? Because then you would see that Saudi and Iran would be more uh, important. Uh, UAE is a big uh, trading partner, but Saudi is uh, bigger. And of course, not to mention countries like Syria, Lebanon, etc. Et you see, in the UK, uh, there are 50, about 50 Chinese, because the UK, you know, member of the UN Security Council, etc. Germany, a huge, massive economic relationship with China, about uh, 35 people. Uh, 35 journalists in Belgium, that's not because of Belgian chocolate, that's because, of course, NATO headquarters. Okay? So I suppose not all of them are journalists. Uh, in Switzerland, roughly similar to uh, to Israel, this is interesting. Uh, Switzerland, uh, there's also the Geneva, the UN uh, Geneva operations in Switzerland, but all, they're all in Geneva, by the way, the Chinese journalists, not in Bern. Um, and also uh, because Switzerland, like Israel, has a, a bilateral relationship that is defined what is called the uh, innovative, innovative, innovative partnership. So uh, maybe this is the, the reason. Now, in terms of the composition, I didn't put it in the graph because it would have been uh, too complicated. Of course, this is not public info. I mean, I collect this information by talking to Chinese journalists in the region. Um, in terms of composition, so you have the sort of a regular operations of Xinhua News Agency, which is indeed a, uh, an arm of the Chinese government, but it's also uh, acts like a wire service, right? So Israel goes to election, Xinhua files a story. The next year, Israel goes to election, Xinhua files, you got the picture. Um, and there's uh, the Chinese TV operations, the China radio. Uh, one, something special about the Chinese media presence uh, here in Israel. So we have uh, also a reporter for Science and Technology Daily. This is, of course, thanks to uh, Israeli technology innovation that China would like to learn, copy, whatever. Uh, the Science and Technology Daily, which is under the Ministry of Science and Technology, has only 12 overseas bureaus, that's it. So this is the G7, Russia, UN, and, and Israel. Okay? Nowhere in the Middle East, whereas, for example, Saudi has only four Chinese journalists. One of them is for a newspaper called uh, Economic Daily, Jinji Rubal, that's under the State Council, right? because there is uh, an economic uh, relationship there. Now, how does the um, finishing, finishing. Uh, but they want to listen more. Uh, how does the Chinese media cover actually uh, Israel? Well, so there is the soft issues or China Israel cooperation part, or the just regular rolling news, you know, like a wire service. Israel goes to elections, but we do it every year. Uh, and then there's the conflict. Now, if you look at the conflict, actually, the Chinese media in Israel is not only objective and balanced, it is more objective and balanced than a lot of Western media, okay? If you know how does the BBC or the Gu or Guardian reports about Israel, it's not fun. So actually, uh, the Chinese media is pretty balanced. When uh, things go off the rocker, then it gets more complicated. So, for example, the Gaza uh, flare-up last year in May, for the first two days, I was glued to, uh, to CCTV, but in Chinese, uh, and other wire services. Uh, the coverage was very balanced and fair, okay? including, say, Israel response to rocket fire from Gaza. 
not like the Guardian, it's uh, the other way around, that this will start everything. Um, but once the conflict sort of became more intractable, the third, the fourth day, China sensed an opportunity to uh, deflect attention from the Xinjiang issue to get at the US, then uh, the Chinese media in Beijing started pouncing uh, on Israel, uh, China convened the uh, emergency session of the Human Rights Council and started to present itself because China's message mostly is towards the global south, started presenting itself as an almost broker. So we cannot influence that of course, but if we can I say I say that the Chinese journalists in Israel are captive audience, right? They're exposed to Chinese uh, to Israeli speaking points obviously. They interview uh, Israeli speakers and this is something we can utilize to uh, balance Towards, uh, towards Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, to begin the Q&A session, I would like to ask the audience first uh, a question, if you have, on the trilateral relationships of China, Israel, and the US, uh, specifically. Uh, does someone have a, a question about to ask? Yeah, and I would uh, then direct it to Dr. Val because I know uh, there's a lot to say. Uh, thank you. I don't have on this triangle, but the question is on a, another triangle, which is uh, uh, Israel-China and Israel-India. Uh, uh, how do you see uh, Israel becoming a factor there? I mean, for Israel relations with India, if China is going to become a factor because India has joined effectively the United States in order to resist the rise of China. Does this work? Uh, you know better than anyone else here uh, that the Israel-India relationship underwent the revolution when Modi came to power. And the most interesting aspect of this change is that it did nothing to hurt India's relations with the Muslim world. And we tried to explain to the Chinese... Hello? Now, now it works, yeah. Uh, India changed its policy for a number of reasons, and one of the main reasons was that the Indians understood that being in the pocket of the Arabs, giving the Arabs the conviction that they have India in their pocket, but no matter what, was not to India's advantage. That India needed to be taken more seriously by the Arabs, and to be taken more seriously meant that India should improve its relations with Israel. Now, this is not the model that China wants to follow, because China has other priorities, and it was uh, it was mentioned that uh, one of the reasons uh, China is uh, selling in the United Nations, is selling Israel out to the Muslim world, is the uh, problem in Xinjiang. China wants uh, uh, the Muslim world to, be, to keep silent about these issues. That's very important. Uh, so, do I answer your question correctly? More or less, yes, yes. Okay, we still, some people still try to explain to the Chinese that it will not harm their relations with the Muslim world if they are less uh, negative to Israel in the United Nations. But on the contrary, it could make China more attractive to the Arabs. The Arabs could then feel that they have to be very careful with China, because China has options. Like India showed that it has options. It's not in the pocket of the Muslim world. China, for the time being, doesn't show the Muslim world that it has options. It's in the, the pocket of the Muslim world, but uh, you know, you have the Xinjiang issue also. And then also, of course, the Chinese foreign ministry is, uh, is like many foreign, like the French foreign ministry, stuck in 150-year-old uh, uh, convictions uh, and uh, being a member of the Communist Party doesn't help very much to be flexible in one's ideas and, and options. So, more I don't want to say about this. Uh, to 
fault. Uh, you mentioned that uh, China is the only country that can moderate the behavior of Iran, Israel's first enemy. Uh, how about Russia? Uh, where does Russia stand in this? Um, Russia has absolutely almost no power over Iran. The, the power of China is that China can live without Iranian oil. China is, has been very careful not to become really dependent on Iranian oil. The first uh, supplier of oil to China is the Arab Gulf, then it's African states, number three is Iran. Iran can be replaced any moment without damage to, uh, to uh, China. And Saudi Arabia more or less openly has made it clear to China that they have large spare capacities and should something ever happen to Iran, they are ready to replace Iran. Uh, this is not the situation of, of India. Um, on the other hand, let's speak about China, uh, Iran. On the other hand, Iran cannot replace China. Iran takes 40% of all the oil of China, uh, of all the oil of Iran, and that the income from that oil is existential for Iran. If that income falls out, there will be famine, there will be revolts. Uh, Iran cannot live without China. China can live without Iran. India is a completely different story. Uh, India is a completely different story, and uh, I wouldn't compare. I wouldn't compare the two. It's, it's uh, Iran, not. I don't know what the proportion of uh, China of Iranian export is in the total exports of Iran. It's not 40 percent. It's maybe 10, 20 percent. It's not the same. Also, India has to be look. Uh, <coughs> India has to be careful. India cannot. Uh, has not the same freedom in, in dealing with Iran that China has because Iran has a very large, okay, sorry, uh, India has a very large Shiite community. They think that about, uh, uh, there are about 180 million Indians are Muslims and 20% of them are Shiites and they are in, in important states, Uttar Pradesh, Let's say like a few other states. There seems to there was in the past a non-written agreement between Tehran and Delhi that as long as uh, Iran is not as long as uh, I mix up as long as India does not go to the end in boycotting Iran, Iran is not going to mobilize its Shiite. Shia population to create troubles in India. So India has to be careful. Uh, China doesn't have to be careful. It doesn't have any, in this sense, apart from again the, the, the general Muslim issue about Xinjiang. There are no Shiites, almost no Shiites in China. They are not the problem. India has to be careful. It cannot do the same. Is this clear? Uh, you understand? We have a yeah, uh, thank you to the panel. Great presentations. Uh, my question is for Alex. Uh, the, um, uh, in terms of, and it's, it's a question, a couple questions about some of the other means that China uses to shape the information space in other countries. And I'm curious whether any of them apply in, in Israel and maybe also uh, you know other parts of the Middle East. Uh, so one, and, and you're well aware of this, would be content exchanges, right, through which Xinhua and other Chinese news services are changing, you know, placing China's perspective in local papers, often in the local language, and that gets, you know, shared with the local population as if that's the objective, you know, non-censored news on China. So curious if that is happening at all in, in Israel. Um, and then, you know, what we've seen more and more is China upping its game on social media in the sense that you have not just, you know, Chinese official spokespeople on Twitter and other places and on Facebook and on YouTube, but you now have people who are paid either directly or indirectly as kind of, you know, they, or they're tourists or they're people who are just kind of touring around a place uh, in China, but they're using that as a mechanism to push China's propaganda. I would imagine that's less of an issue in Israel because it's probably not in, in Hebrew, but I'm just curious. And, and then I guess to what extent any of that, if it's not applying in Israel, you've seen it applying in, in other parts of the region. 
we'll take one more here. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll take to the debate um, on, on the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious where the U.S. government is kind of failing in its messaging. And, and I'm not as familiar with the, the messaging towards Israel, but I know that within the U.S. government, in the cases of Japan, in the EU, um, other partners, there's always this uh, messaging about uh, engaging with China involving or leading to potential tech theft, talent acquisition, um, or an overdependence in, in however we can frame that. So I'm wondering whether those concerns are, like, if, if any of those concerns resonate with Israel, um, if so, in what way? You know, uh, Tuvia, 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 I could take a little of this bait on the same one and perhaps Agalia. But the Americans, I've, what we're afraid of is your relationship with China is, is skinny. Ours is global. We don't want to come across the Taiwan, they come across the Taiwan Strait with Israeli tech directed at the United States. So, you know, it's a broader relationship we have with them. And so our concerns are more global. And I would say that maybe that is part of the discord. And perhaps uh, this could be part of the response that Professor uh, Lavi can respond to. Yes, thank you, David. Two very good questions. Numerous attempts over the years by the Chinese media delegations and local to uh, sign contact sharing agreements. Uh, I suppose it helps uh, living in a country with a language that you know, nobody really speaks. It's very challenging. Like I said, there's no Chinese language media in Israel, like in other countries, Australia, for example. Um, so occasionally the Chinese embassy uh, puts a, you know, a two-pager in the Jerusalem Post about some Chinese holiday or China-Israel. Uh, that's about it. There's just there's, there's nothing else. Uh, in terms of uh, opinion leaders, this is very interesting. The Chinese embassy in Israel opened its Facebook page last year. And it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, idle. Um, I'm not aware of anything on Twitter. The Taiwan office here in Israel is extremely active. Uh, um, it's very interesting what you say about KOL. So again, if you want to speak to Israeli audience, you have to speak Hebrew, right? So all of these paid KOLs, uh, it's interesting, one of them is in Israeli. I mean, my former uh, colleague in Dow Jones, Paul Moser, did a piece in the New York Times about this army of uh, KOLs, you know, saying that Xinjiang is all hunky-dory. It's very interesting. You know, it may work in the U.S. Here in Israel, we, where we know Muslim culture, so this Israeli blogger enters an Uyghur home, so-called so happy home, there's not a single element of Muslim culture in the house. Okay, no Quran, no paintings, no Kaab, nothing. Okay, so totally sanitized. So you just have to understand what we're doing. So, uh, no, not much uh, success in Israel. The, the, embassy, the embassy. It's, it's not the Chinese embassy. Yeah, but it's not the journalists. Not the media. It's not the not the story of the embassy. The story of the embassy is that there was a, a piece of Jerusalem Post uh, that uh, published the interview with the foreign ministry, foreign so-called foreign minister of Taiwan. If I would be a Chinese, I would be now. Uh, as, as a, I will represent the Chinese. Okay, so uh, the Chinese did not like it, so they, they published. Uh, they asked the the Jerusalem Post to take down the article and apologize uh, for, of course, all the allegations that were uh, written there, etc., etc. And the Jerusalem Post editor said, no. I will not do that. This is not what we do here. And it was a little bit of, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's not really a threat. It's not that the Chinese embassy threatened uh, Jay Post, but um, they kind of said, if you want us to publish papers, and we, they did publish papers in Jerusalem Post, uh, before that, uh, if you want us to publish papers here, your, your paper, you can't act like that, not according to our um, I don't know, core interests or whatever. No, no. And in the side of the... Yeah, okay. Sorry, just to uh, amplify. Um, 
Yes, this was the Chinese embassy. This was the uh, charge d'affaires, the number two in the Chinese embassy. I've known him for 11 years, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He has issued similar threats in the past for uh, other things. That's free publicity for Juju Flam Post. I mean, it was unbelievably stupid. I actually sat with the uh, bureau chief of Xinhua here, and she was complaining to me how the Chinese government just doesn't know how to do public relations. What about it? Yeah, can I, can I say something? Look, the Chinese embassy clearly overreacted. Someone got very nervous, though. Jerusalem Post, which I read every day, has been going on, has been campaigning against China for years now. Their uh, chief editor, Jacob Katz, started more than a year, one and a half years ago, is a very nasty article that had the title, We Owe the Chinese Nothing. In that article, he uh, sort of ridiculed the Shanghai story, where Shanghai saved 20,000 Jews during the Shoah. The Chinese are very proud of this. There isn't much they can be proud of in their relationship with the rest of them. Of this, they are proud. They expect the Jews to be grateful, the Jews are grateful. And when uh, Yitzhak Rabin visited China in his first visit, there was a big event when he opened uh, the, the uh, monument uh, thanking the Chinese people of Shanghai for saving so many Jews. It wasn't necessary to uh, provoke the Chinese on this. Uh, as there was no reaction, Jacob Katz repeated exactly the same article the same, the same article again one year later, which was about three or four months ago. That second time, the article was translated into Chinese, created a storm in China, and, and triggered that uh, famous uh, wave of anti-Semitism in the Chinese social media. So, okay, I mean, the Jews in the Post is not innocent. Uh, they have an argument with China. They, they, they don't like China. The Chinese are a bit angry. Uh, they overreacted. That guy from the embassy uh, should probably should probably go and uh, should probably send into one of the excellent uh, international relations uh, seminars of Beida or or uh, 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 other Chinese universities to learn that in the West uh, the press is free, all is free. Uh, Yes, there is a possibility that he was acting uh, under, uh, you know, orders from Beijing. But uh, okay, uh, to answer your question, if I can, as I understand it, you asked about whether the U.S. warned uh, Israel from uh, Chinese investment in infrastructure and, and the high-tech sector. Of course, they did, as I explained in my, in my, uh, my talk before. Uh, both in the high-tech and in the infrastructure, they did numerous time. Both uh, officials, we had Pompeo visiting here, Lincoln visiting here, other uh, officials from various uh, um, 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 levels, uh, from from top to bottom, and uh, not only officials. Also, they, they came to warn, uh, not warn, but to, to explain. Uh, even at the INSS, they came to explain the, the U.S. position, okay, about regarding Chinese. Uh, I don't think this. What I know, I don't think that the U.S. threatened Israel. If you don't do that, we'll do that. But it's not exactly our relations. It did not get to that point. Um, I think that at the beginning, the U.S. had problems of its own def defining what is exactly is the threat. Because when Trump started all this, or so it, it didn't really start it, but it came out really strong with Trump. But when he came out with this, with this so-called uh, trade war, etc., it was very difficult for the U.S. to explain what was the problem because there was no gun on the table. Okay, everything that you say, you can give another explanation for it. This, you say that trap, that trap. You, I can give you uh, uh, facts that say the other way around. So there was a problem for for uh, the U.S. also to define also. What can be cooperated with China and what no, what not? Because the U.S. itself cooperates with China in uh, various fields. Okay, so I think now uh, under Biden administration, uh, not at the beginning, but certainly now, the picture is more clear for the U.S. and therefore it's more clear for Israel. Okay, now Israel, uh, which and this is my last point. I can see you have a question. Israel um, 
is not the place of the US. China is not an enemy of Israel. It doesn't threaten Israel's existence like it threatens US existence, not militarily. Not military, okay? Uh, so Israel wants to keep its economy going and growing, and you cannot ignore the second uh, economy in the world, okay? So we need to find, um, I don't know, the, 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 the king's way, uh, the, the, the path, the right path. And we say, you know, like, you know, that there are no military connections between Israel and China, okay? This was shut down in 2000 something. So, we can say that you don't do military, but you do these and these sectors, and for this you need to screen it according to some rules, and we are at the process of it. We have four questions here. We have one here, one here, one here, and one there. Let's do two, two. Two, two. Okay, so we go one, two, and then one, two. I apologize, I'm going to do the worst thing as someone asking a question, which is really to make a statement. Uh, but I, my name is Daniel DeVries, and I work at the U.S. Embassy here. And I wanted to address some of the topics that were, that were raised and some of the questions, particularly from Tuvia, and hopefully uh, clarify and maybe explain the U.S. position uh, on the PRC's relations with Israel in a way that, uh, from, a, from an authoritative source, as a representative of the U.S. government. So, uh, to Tuvia's question about the former Mossad director who said, we don't see China as an enemy. We also don't see China as an enemy. We take particular issues with certain policies and actions of the government of the PRC, but we certainly don't see China as an, as an enemy of the United States. And we wouldn't encourage Israel uh, to do that either. To Gali's point that Israel needs to grow its economy and, and China is an important part of that, the PRC is an important trade partner of the United States. We have had lots of great economic relations for a long time. We continue to do so. Lots of American companies like make money in China, but the reverse is true as well. So I would encourage Israel to continue pursuing economic relations with the PRC. However, it should be done in a way that protects Israel's economic and national security interests. So, uh, you know, there is a, a three-way relationship here, and, you know, officials often say we don't, we don't want to be in the position of choosing who in the three that we, whose interests we need to look out for. But I would say the answer is very clear for Israel. Israel needs to look out for Israel's interests, number one. And I think that Israeli, the public at times, and also Israeli officials, uh, are perhaps distracted by the economic opportunities, or perhaps are viewing the PRC's actions in a way that's similar to how the United States viewed the PRC several years ago, and maybe are not sufficiently adapted to the change in the dynamics. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, and one that I think cannot be ignored is the PRC's role as Iran's principal diplomatic, military, and economic lifeline. Iran, you know, Israel and the United States have an ongoing dialogue and have for years about the importance of uh, doing everything that we can to constrain Iran, particularly its nuclear program. However, the PRC, and its actions and its relationship with Iran allows Iran to continue to pursue its nuclear program. And so we, and I'll speak frankly, at times it's a little frustrating. We have these conversations, and you'll read about this in the media, about, for instance, whether or not we should add an additional round of sanctions on Iran, even on top of existing sanctions on the same companies and the same entities that already exist. And at the same time, companies that we have banned from the United States are doing business because of their relation, because PRC companies who have been banned from the United States because of their relations with Iran are still doing business in Israel today. And I'll give you one example, it's Huawei. Huawei, the CFO who was arrested in, uh, in Vancouver several years ago uh, on charges in the United States, those were for fraud connected to violating Iran sanctions. Just last week, an Israeli company announced that they are going to now open up uh, you know, the consumer market to Huawei consumer goods. So this is separate from the 5G conversation, but at the same time, I have to ask, why is this company that the United States says cannot do business in the United States because of its ties to Iran, why is that company doing business in, in Israel? And I can give you several other examples. I mean, DJI is a drone company, does business in Iran, doesn't do business, uh, sorry, does business in Iran, 
doesn't do business in the United States is still doing business in Israel. The uh, you know, Toka Networks is an R&D center producing some of the best, you know, these are veterans of United 8200, some of the best minds and signal intelligence in the world are working for Huawei here in Herzliya. We wouldn't allow that in the United States, and I, I hope that Israel maybe would take a different look at that. When we talked, I mentioned earlier that Israel should continue to have economic relations with Iran. Israeli officials tell us, you know, we we only operate in the safe spaces. Of course, you know, there's no weapon sales. Things like our advanced AI, quantum computing, these are things that are off the table. Where we feel safe is working on things like water, healthcare, agritech. And I would, I would caution that those areas are not necessarily as safe as, uh, as Israelis may wish that they were. And I'll, I'll just cite one example in, in Agritech. Israel is a, a leader in this field, and, uh, and a lot of the new innovations, it's, it's not the drip irrigation of 50 years ago that Israel developed, but it's AI, it's advanced computing. These are what's driving the agricultural innovations of the future. And a lot of these, these components have dual use components. And there's a clear path between uh, these, these types of technologies to PRC missile programs, to Iran's missile programs, to the Houthi missile programs, to Hezbollah missile programs, to rocket programs in Gaza. And so I ask, is Israel doing enough to take these precautions to protect its own national security interests? And I'll make one last point on the healthcare industry, which is that an Israeli physician uh, out of Shiva Hospital, uh, I'll give him credit for this, 15 years ago was one of the leaders in uncovering that the PRC was using um, uh, prisoners, ex was executing prisoners for and harvesting their organs for organ transplant. And this was a business that was run out of the PRC where uh, you know foreigners would come, presumably Chinese citizens as well, but foreigners could come and uh, you know purchase organs that were, I assume unknowingly, but purchase organs that were harvested uh, from for executed prisoners. The same physician recently published in the United States and it got media attention around the world that some of these prisoners whose organs were harvested, their hearts and their lungs were still alive at the time. And so, you know, the, there's other companies that we've been from the United States, like uh, Beijing Genomics. I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm talking at length. Uh, this is a passion of mine, so I thank you for giving me the microphone for a moment. Uh, but, you know, this maybe I'll just end on a question of values in that Israel has been clear in its support of, and it's not just the Israeli government, but the Israeli people. These are fundamental values that Israel and the United States share. We have, uh, you know, this is the bedrock of our foundation. It's not president to prime minister. It's not government to government. It's the foundation of our relationship is people to people because of our shared values and our shared history. And, you know, when you talk about a, a government that is committing mass atrocities. I know the, the term genocide isn't accepted by everyone, but what's not in question what's happening in Xinjiang are you know, forced abortion, forced sterilizations, forced labor, um, you know, travel bans, detentions in the middle of the night. These things are not in question. Anyway, I'll, I'll just end on this point, which is that, uh, you know, I think we have, Israel should, uh, so we have an ongoing dialogue with Israel about the way that these, uh, that its relations with the PRC impacts not U.S. interests, but Israel's core interests, its values, its economic security, and its national security. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Jeff Dowby, and I think Mr. DeVry actually answered uh, a lot of my question, but uh, Gadia, your point was very, very well taken uh, about the American double standard. Uh, I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill in advocating for Israel, and um, back in 1999, 2000, when we were uh, involved in the whole Falcon and uh, Harpy uh, situation, uh, when I would walk into a member of Congress and we would discuss uh, the issues and talking points, uh, things as irrelevant as the Saudi Arabia Accountability Act. At the end of our meetings, and these were with very, very pro-Israel members on both sides of the aisle, uh, inevitably uh, the question of uh, what can Israel do about the uh, Falcon and the Harpy situation. And they were very, very exercised by this, and uh, I had a boiler 
plate response, which was basically that uh, Israel takes very, very seriously the concerns of the American government, uh, but after all, it is a sovereign state and it has to act in the best, best interests of Israel. Uh, so, uh, what kind of guidance can you provide for us, those of us who advocate for Israel, uh, in terms of confronting these kinds of situations, whether it be in Congress or uh, other venues? Um, first, I want to say that uh, Daniel uh, said before that uh, Israel, it, they don't, the US doesn't want US to choose, but Israel has already chosen a long time ago. So it's really not a choice. So Israel is on the side of the US. And I don't say it because you're in the world, you know that. Uh, the US is the best friend of Israel for many uh, different reasons. We have our differences, we don't agree, we don't see eye to eye, many, many issues, and that's fine. Uh, but we do know how to sit and talk about it. Okay, we have the differences with the Chinese, and we talk to them uh, also. But uh, let's say that their listening uh, uh, qualities are different. Um, so, what can Israel do? It's, it's a tough question because I'm not a politician. Um, I, 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 think, I think that actually Israel, well, um, and, and, and Daniel will, will not agree with me here. Uh, I think Israel, what Israel does is actually doing the, the good, he took the good solution somehow. Some, uh, let me say, let me rephrase that. For some reason, Chinese companies have difficult time being or getting into Israel. I think it's the Balagan, the Israeli Balagan, you know, Israeli mess, bureaucratic mess that um, doesn't enable Chinese companies to get inside Israel so easily. This is one thing. Also, Israeli are very paranoid. So when we have to deal with anyone, we actually ask what does he want? How is he going to manipulate me? Is he going to take, I don't know, advantage of me? This is something in our, our DNA. So if you, if you look into in Chinese investments in Israel, not, not in the infrastructure, just in high tech or whatever, and uh, my colleague Doron Ela wrote about it, um, you see that actually the Chinese investments in high tech are very low in Israel. And if you look at the infrastructure, as I explained before, they usually do uh, um, construction work and not uh, operation. So actually, they don't have the, 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 they cannot have the influence. However, I do agree with the US that there are some sectors that we need to be more careful. For example, AI and uh, several other different uh, 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 sectors, uh, sorry, dual use. Of course, we, we need to make. So we have the black, like military stuff. You have the white. Okay, we thought about it. For example, like culture and uh, you know, uh, culture, etc. Okay, we, we can discuss it more. And you have the gray side, which we don't really know, because if you're talking about, for example, uh, I don't know, um, some kind of. Uh, medical instrument and you have some kind of laser beam inside okay and it you use it to i don't know to do uh, to operate better in the operation room but this same technology can be used in i don't know in, a, in the missile uh, program so this is what I to i'm talking about dual use we need to identify these fields and make sure exactly uh, maybe case by sense, uh, case by, by case sensitive uh, solution. And this is why we need a screening mechanism. And we do have a screening mechanism, but not for high tech. Because Israel still thinks that it's an open market. This is actually what the government thought about it, I thought, thought here uh, from the Net Netanyahu time, and the, the, the last government did not change it. Uh, and uh, now it will not change it because it's uh, over also. So if we go back to Netanyahu, this is the way we're going to. An open market and no, no restrictions. Um, 
So that's it. Just, just, just one second, just one uh, last comment to uh, uh, Daniel. Um, you know, the pupil, we, we, this is China MENA, right? It's just, not just about Israel, even though this panel is. Uh, you know, is, even though Israel is a you know, Western country and uh, certainly an ally of the US, there's one thing that is common uh, between Israel and the global south, I think. In, and that is that Israel does not, and this is to answer you know, all of these concerns that we've talked about, and there's no easy solution, of course. Israel does not view China through an ideological lens like the US does. The US relationship with China was always ideological. Okay? Uh, you say that uh, China is not an enemy of the US, doesn't sound like that from official US statements, I have to say. And one last word about Iran. For sure, uh, Iran needs China more than China needs Iran. And, you know, obviously, uh, China uses Iran as a as a tool to get at the U.S. It doesn't help Israel, of course. But uh, the JCPOA, which I think most of the people in Israel are unhappy about, including the government of Israel, was started by the U.S., not China, including under the Obama administration behind Israel's back. Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Okay. Um, we, have, uh, we have the two Elans who have been yeah, waiting very patiently. Yes. But I do have to sneak one in for uh, Shalom. Uh, he had mentioned the rise of anti-Semitism, and I'm curious if you can uh, help us to better understand this phenomenon, and I know Tuvi as the expert, so I'm sneaking that one in because it's a fascinating development. And here is the first Elan. Uh, yeah. or, all right, let, let me just uh, answer this real quickly because we have two more in line. So, the idea of the rise of anti-Semitism, uh, I don't know if there really is a rise. In fact, we don't know if there is in a rise of Chinese nationalism. Uh, it is debated still in literature. Uh, we just spoke about this uh, the other night. And I think there is a rise. I see indication to this on my day-to-day -day basis. And even without a rising trend, the stuff I see online during my work is horroring and shocking, even without rise, coming from the top intellectual elites in China. So, in order to confirm that there really is a rise, we need to uh, prove this empirically, uh, like the social scientists that we are, uh, and that's uh, my response to that. Uh, next two questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, as, as a reader of Sun Tzu, I wonder if we are uh, underestimating Chinese uh, policy uh, both the soft power and the hard power. I, I heard analysis of the ports that suggest that the Chinese are able to put all sort of uh, embed equipment and, and uh, hardware that will allow them to track uh, uh, military uh, vessels going in and out of the ports. Uh, I heard, uh, we certainly know, I, I learned about Yitzhik when I first came back to Israel, who's a, who's a Chinese uh, kind of a propaganda person doing all sort of uh, social media stuff. Of course you have TikTok and Huawei. Uh, my guess also is that China has a strategy, a country by country strategy of engagement given the nuances. And we are looking for these templates from rule-based countries, whereas in fact China is very relation-based and very uh, bilateral in their approach. So I wonder if you can kind of uh, go deeper into the more nuanced and uh, Chinese style propaganda used in Israel and in other places uh, that you can give us some, some examples. Thank you, Ivan. And uh, next question before we turn back to our panelists. Oh, and we also have uh, Mr. Swirsky. Uh, so we'll add a third one. Just for Okay. Uh, so, by the way, thanks to all of you. because This has really been fascinating and thought-provoking, and I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so a quick comment and a question. Um, the comment is... Can you more to the mic? Yeah, sorry. The comment is to Galia's point about the need for, uh, you know, the, the problematics of uh, potentially dual-use uh, technology and the need for a case-by-case -case analysis. I would argue that that's exactly the right approach because it's very clear that, and you sort of said, you know, there's a white list, like construction, there's a gray, there's a gray list, and a black list. But I think it's necessary to point out that even the white list may not be so white. And the great example that I would show you is the uh, recently scuppered Chinese bid for the Tel Aviv light rail, which if the Chinese had built, had, had won the tender. 
Can you repeat the last sentence? Oh yeah, yeah. The 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 recently China's recent decision to back out of the you know to, to China didn't win the the Tel Aviv light rail tender. Had they won, they would have got to construct the train cars. They would have also gotten to construct the Wi-Fi that the China, the Israeli soldiers that use their phones will use while they ride on those cars. So the point is, it's not so black and white in the sense that there's a white list and a gray list and a black list. Like my sense is that the case-by-case -case basis is exactly right. We need to sort of to look at the sort of the different permutations. My question is to Alex. Uh, so I spent a lot of time looking at uh, disinformation and propaganda, and there has been a really marked convergence between Russian and Chinese and Iranian propaganda and disinformation, certainly as it relates to COVID and as it relates to pandemic and vaccine skepticism and things like that. But you're also seeing this rather alarming larger trend in the way Chinese, the Chinese are messaging, not so much on television, but certainly on social media, where the focus is now more and more on the same focus that the Russians have had for a long time which is undermining trust in democratic institutions. Uh, the, the idea that democratic institutions are fragile, that they're frankly unrepresentative, and that the Chinese model is better. So what I'm actually curious about is sort of the logical extension of your presentation, which is, what are they doing? What are they saying in the online space? Are they messaging this way to Israel as well, and to Israeli audiences, or is this just an American phenomenon? All right, thank you. So before we get to the last question of Mr. Swirsky, let just let uh, Alex address the two questions from uh, Elon uh, and Elon, and uh, then back to Dr. Wall. Yes, so I mentioned the China Radio International uh, in Hebrew. Uh, look, to be honest, we cannot answer if it's effective without polling, and unfortunately we don't have any serious polling. Uh, on this, uh, the last, sometimes Pew includes Israel in its uh, surveys. Uh, the last time Pew included survey of you know, global attitudes toward China, unfortunately, it was 2019. Uh, and at that point, uh, China was very popular in Israel, 66% of approval in Israel, which is one of the highest in the world. I suppose uh, the pandemic uh, put a dent uh, on it. Uh, I think and probably betray my age here. I don't think eat six uh, Facebook videos are very uh, convincing. Uh, there's nothing about you know Ukraine, Xinjiang. It's only soft stuff. Recently, Itzik had a baby, and so he's uh, showcasing his uh, baby. Yeah, even. Um, I don't know how effect again without serious study, but I doubt that one person on Facebook. Uh, would do that. Uh, you know, the uh, vice president of the China Media Group, that's the China Media Group, that's the radio, international, uh, the, the TV, international radio, national radio, merged in 2018. The vice president was in China, uh, was in Israel. Um, I met with him in 2019. Um, he sort of tried to make a bold effort to understand from us, uh, is, it, is it working, uh, eight six videos? Uh, again, without uh, hard data, it's uh, it's hard to it's hard to say. In general, again, this is the Israel's advantage in terms of you know uh, Ukraine or you know COVID. There's very limited stuff in Hebrew, very very limited. So you know, I suppose Israelis go online and you know I don't know. Again, there's one person here that watches uh, CGTN uh, English. Um, I usually don't, uh, but you're right that there's a, there's an effort uh, to influence opinion specifically around COVID, but that's more in Arabic. So she see the CGTN Arabic uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. There was a video making the rounds, uh, saying you know uh, a, a Chinese uh, journalist for CGTN uh, speaking in fluent Arabic, uh, talking about how COVID did not come from did not originate from China. I haven't seen these kind of messages uh, in Israel. You know, and up until they, they launch a Hebrew channel, maybe uh, we will not know. I am not sure how much Russia and China are coordinated on social media. Uh, there's a recent study by Alex Gabuya from the Carnegie Foundation comparing messages. He did not come to the conclusion that uh, China and Russia are so, uh, so unified. If you want, uh, 
foreign influence on Israeli media, look at Russian media. That's a big thing, okay? Because, you know, including me, I admit it, I'm from the Soviet Union, you know, a fifth of Israelis speak Russian, and there's a, you know, a lot of Israelis, immigrants from the Soviet Union, watch Russian media. And this is, I think, much more effective than Chinese media. Hello, audible? I wanted to make a comment about the dual use issue. Uh, I started this issue in my earlier life as a science and technology expert at the OECD in Paris. Look, uh, more and more, separating dual use from non-dual use is becoming difficult if not impossible. Because more and more, every profound scientific discovery can be militarily used breakthroughs in the in theoretical mathematics in probability theory have been used immediately in improving intercontinental ballistic missiles. The mathematicians who made these breakthroughs and presented them in international mathematical conferences had no idea that they would immediately be used to, pro to improve uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, exactitude the precision of intercontinental missiles, and I can give you other examples. So some of the some of the tensions between Israel and the United States uh, on dual use are uh, tensions that are inherent in the fast progress of science, and uh, there have been differences of opinion which are honest and not necessarily uh, constructed. Sometimes it is not possible to make the difference. I can give you concrete examples in, the, in Israel's experience when, when uh, the, um, the, the office in, uh, that uh, studies, uh, that has to control Israel's tech exports to China forbade Israel from uh, uh, selling to China certain security equipments. Israel, of course, forbade it, and it turned out that General Electric sold equivalent security equipment to China because someone found that this is not dual use and others found it is dual use. Sometimes you really, increasingly this is a problem, increasingly fundamental breakthroughs in health, in biology, are usable, are usable in military applications. Increasingly uh, uh, nanotechnology is uh, fundamental research and militarily usable. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be less and less easy to separate these. So we have a real problem. Would you agree with it? Short last question for Mr. Swirsky and uh, question is, yeah. and, and, and then uh, uh, so, uh, my question is regarding agriculture. Just a second though. Uh, 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 one, one, uh, just one, okay. one, one sentence, just to, to answer the, the competence uh, question, I think you both asked for it. Uh, four countries in Israel are required by the, the, the contract to use, uh, to some extent, Israeli uh, companies and to use Israeli components. And even if they don't, uh, for this one solution, and uh, of course the security agencies are, uh, this is one of their jobs. Okay. To, to, Take, take care of this will not be uh, some kind of espionage uh, uh, tool. Okay, so that's it. That's what I was. My right. question, my question is really to Daniel because first time I heard it, it was a question of agriculture. It's uh, Israel's an agriculture country, and we have a lot of research. So is this becoming a problem? Is it a problem? Thank you. I okay, I think. I think Oh, yes, of course. And well, that will have to conclude. And the will have the last word, and then you. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'm quite surprised by the tenor of my uh, compatriots on relations uh, on this issue with America. You know, there is a Latin uh, uh, proverb what Jupiter can do, the bull can't do. We shouldn't forget that Israel is a small country. And Israel is our most important ally, and it's an extremely important pillar in our national security. So, uh, therefore, we should be careful not to play with Americans on this issue, even if I would agree with my colleagues that some of the American reactions are totally hysterical. 
So what? So what if we we'll lose a few billion dollars in deals with, a, with, a, with China? We should not risk our relationship with China for a few dollars. With the U.S. With the U.S. <laughs> here, here. All right. So, uh, doubt, there is no doubt. <laughs> and this is uh, our time. Uh, thank you very much to our three panelists. Uh, it's been really fascinating. And before we conclude, I'd like to invite back to the stage uh, my colleague and friend, Professor Joshua Eisman, the man that I brought us all here. Uh, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to our guests for being with us. Thank you to the for hosting us, the technical team, the administrative team, Adi. Uh, you've all been just fantastic, making this day really memorable and important, and I'm sure it will evolve into more conversation after we finish. Uh, Josh? Uh, Wait, Alex, I'm going to be very quick, so you can just, uh, you know, my goal is not to keep us any longer. I think we've all... Oh yeah, oh yes, I will finish on that. Okay, I'll, I'll finish on that point. Look, I don't know about you, but by the fact that I see only a few folks who have left from the day, I believe that we have really accomplished something here. I've, I've personally learned a lot. And this panel, by the way, it was fantastic. I, I really can't congratulate you enough. I, I really can't. You know, you don't get this perspective in Washington much. And so I think, I, you know, I really learned a lot. But look, it's been a long day, so it's worth kind of refreshing a little bit where we started, right? We began our discussion at the 50,000 foot level, talking, uh, Professor or Chen, uh, Chen Yunnan talking about BRI and geostrategy. We talked about the Uyghur situation and how we see this issue. We talked about Russia and China relations. We talked about India and China. We talked about Afghanistan and China. And then we talked about Africa and China. We talked about FOCAC. Um, uh, uh, Sharon Bear David talked about a case study in Ethiopia on the ground at the very grassroots level and then Joseph came up here and gave us amazing data about how different countries view China right um, and throughout the African continent really I think covered uh, so much in that in that one panel on China Africa and then we were treated to a master class by Professor Shalom Wall about the history of uh, Ju uh, Jewish uh, Chinese relations um, and uh, Galia Levy talking about the risks or the possible risks involved, uh, giving us a, a real uh, a tight summary of what those risks are and, and how risky though they are. And then Alex uh, Pesner talking about the propaganda issues. Um, and so we have covered really so much. And I, I can't thank you all enough for coming and sticking through uh, the heat. Um, and then, you know, finally, um, I just want to thank our partner, the JISS. Uh, Ephraim, I want to thank Tubia, uh, the man with the plan, uh, for sticking uh, through this and, and helping and being so supportive. And, and then, you know, of course, I have to thank my, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Noble, uh, who has been so supportive of me uh, throughout all of the different uh, ideas I've had, uh, some better than others, and I would count this one among the best, to be sure. Um, and so that's all I wanted to say, right? I just wanted to kind of bring us full circle to some degree so we know how much we really have, have learned today. And, and so the final thing, as Ephraim says, is we're going to leave a little early for the participants, uh, for the speakers. We're going to have a dinner and we'll be leaving from the front at uh, 6.45. Um, and then, you know, maybe there is one substantive point I can make here that I think I gleaned from today, but I think is also very important uh, to take from this discussion. And that is the way in which China really uses personal relationships all around the world to achieve national and party specific objectives, right? And then this is a, this is, I wouldn't say it's entirely unique to China, but I would say they do it among the best, right? This, this, this idea that you build Guanxi and then that Guanxi can then be used in different arenas for different uh, uh, reasons. And I think that that was one thing we heard in all the panels, a kind of cross-cutting point. Um, the way that China is able to uh, successfully achieve this. So um, with that, uh, just a very quick overview. I want to thank you all uh, for spending your day with us, and uh, hopefully we'll be treating you to some more similar such events in the future. And uh, thank you again to our hosts here at the Tantor facility. So.